영어 원서 읽기 500번 읽기 19번째 어, 버니큘라 챕터 7부터 9까지 마무리 지어 보도록 하겠습니다. 버니큘라 챕터 7 A new friend in need In the days that followed, Chester's behavior was exemplary. He purred and he cooed and he cleaned his paws and he rubbed up against everyone's legs to show what a good boy he was. I was getting worried. Chester, act, Chester acts that way only when he has something devious in the back of his mind. But I didn't know what it was. He had tried everything in the book to, in the book to get rid of vampires. But I didn't know what it was. He had tried everything in the book to get rid of vampires. And all his efforts had paled. But I knew from the expression on his face that something was definitely up. Of course, I didn't know for certain, because he had not spoken to me since the steak incident. I guess he realized that my heart just wasn't in the destruction of the burning vampire. In fact, I was beginning to like the little fellow. The Molos were relieved by Chester's improved behavior. They they didn't know how to account for they didn't know how to account for his uh, strange doings, but to their credit, they were willing to let be bygones be bygones. The only disturbing factor in all our lives was the reappearance of the white visitors each morning in the kitchen. And yet, after a few days, even the stopped and even they stopped, and the life seemed to return to normal. Oh, one evening, I dropped by Bonicula's cage to chat. I found myself doing that more and more since Chester had stopped talking to me. Of course, Bonicula didn't talk back, but he was a good listener. I began to think of him as a friend, a strange one, granted, but one can't always choose one's friend. I was distressed this particular evening to see that he was dragging his ears. As it were, he looked tired and listless. I felt his nose and it seemed a little warmer than it should have been. I became alarmed. I ran over to Toby, who was doing a picture puzzle on the floor, and began to bark. Something I do only in cases of extreme, extreme emergency, since even I do not care for the sound. What's the matter, Harold? Toby asked without moving. Are there burglars? I ran to the cage and looked at Bonicula. I looked back at Toby and whimpered. Toby just looked confused. Do you want to play with the Bonicula? Shall I take him out of the cage? Woof! I responded, indicating I hoped that that was indeed what he should do. I'll ask mom and dad, Harold. You wait here. He was back in, in a minute, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Harold, but mom says you can't play with the rabbit. It causes, too, it causes too much commotion. I looked down at the floor and whimpered again. Sorry, Harold. Maybe later, when we are all in here together. I regarded the bunicula whose eyes met mine. He gave a little shudder. And I felt like crying. My friend was sick, and I didn't know what to do. I wished I could tell Chester, but I knew it was no use. He was just too mad at me. I would have to solve this one out on my own. That night, I couldn't sleep, worrying about Bonicula. I decided to go downstairs and check on his condition. What I saw when I entered the living room horrified me. Bernicola was out of his cage on the floor while Chester stood in front of him, a piece of garlic around his neck and his arms outstretched, blocking the kitchen door. Suddenly, it all fell into place. Chester was a starving Bernicola. Of course, that's why he seemed so listless, and that's why the vegetables had stopped turning white. Chester had made it impossible for Bernicola to eat. Chester, I cried. Chester jumped a very high jump. What are you doing down here? He spat at me as he landed. I know what you're doing, Chester, and the jig is up. That little bunny never hurt anybody. All he's doing is eating his own wing. What do you care if he drains a few vegetables? He's a vampire, Chester snarled. Today, vegetables. Tomorrow, the world. I think perhaps you're overstating your case, I suggested cautiously. Go back to bed, Harold. This is larger than two of us. It may seem harsh, 
but I'm only being cruel to be kind. Who's he being kind to? I wondered as I went back, uh, as I went back upstairs. The tomatoes and the chicken is of the world. Maybe a few cabbages. It just didn't make sense. But I could see I wasn't going to get anywhere with the Cheshire tonight. Tomorrow, however, would be another story. And I was determined that by hook or by crook, my friend Bunikla would eat by sundown the next day. Chapter 8 Disaster in the Dining Room I realized that there was nothing I could do for Bunikla during the day, since he was sleeping, but that gave me time to plan my strategy. At first, I thought I would bring food to his cage. But then it occurred to me that Chester must be taking everything away that was given to him. Pete and Toby usually left the letters for Bunikula during the day while he was sleeping. And Chester, ever watchful, probably napped it each evening just before the rabbit awoke. No, there would have to be another way. I thought and thought all afternoon. And I could see that Chester had done a good job of isolating Bonicula from his food. There was no way I could think of to overcome Chester's game plan. As the evening drew closer and I grew more and more frantic, I stumbled into the dining room and saw the answer to my problem sitting before me on the table. It was a big bowl of salad. All I had to do was get Bonicula to the salad and let him get his fill before the family came in to eat. With that funny white dressing on it, they would never notice if a few vegetables were white. I ran to the hallway to check the clock. 6.15. It would be 15 minutes before the sun went down and Bonicula woke up. I would then need at least 5 minutes to get him from his cage to the table and feed him. All I had to do was make sure no one came into the room until he had finished. I needed a good 20 minutes at least. I went back into the living room. Chester was asleep on his brown velvet chair, shedding in his sleep, still worn out from the previous night's activities. I checked the upstairs. Toby was reading in his room. The last chapter of Treasure Island I noted Pete, who should have been doing his homework, was listening to record record in his room. I ran, to, ran down to the kitchen. Hello, Harold, Mrs. Muller said as I came through the door. What's new? Other than a rabbit starving in the next room, and an imminent attack on your salad bowl, nothing, I thought. I stood at her feet and panted. She scratched my head. This gave me a moment to check out how far she was in her cooking. Sorry, Harold, she said. I have to baste this chicken. I noticed the oven timer still had 35 minutes to go. A little bit tight, I thought, but I can make it. Now, where is Mr. Monroe? I went to the front door and whimpered loudly. Mrs. Mona followed me. Are you waiting for Daddy, Harold? He will be home soon. Soon isn't good enough. How soon? I whimpered again. Patience, boy. He's late at a school meeting. He should be here any time. She went back into the kitchen and I checked the clock. 6.25. It was getting dark and the chatter was still asleep. Time to swing into action. Having watched the chatter undo the lock on Bonicula's cage, and having participated in the unfortunate stick episode some days earlier, I knew I would have no problem getting Bonicula out. I just had to be a little more careful where I positioned my head so that I wouldn't find myself in the humiliating predicament of getting stuck a second time. My timing was perfect. With Bonicula swinging peacefully from my teeth, I made my way stealthily toward the dining room as the last rays of the sunlight gave way to the dark of night. Once inside the dining room door, Bonicula awakened in great bewilderment. It is not every day after all, and one finds oneself upon awakening, hanging from the jaws of a fellow creature, even so caring and gentle a creature as myself. Bonicula opened his eyes wide and turned his face as best he could to me. I jumped up onto the nearest chair and placed the rabbit safely on the table's edge. Okay, I whispered. There's your dinner. Go to it. Get your fill as fast as you can, Paul Bunny. I'll stand guard. I don't know that Panicula fully understood what was going on, but the sight of the vegetables 
piled high in the center of the table, sent him scurrying in their direction. He was very hungry. As luck would have it, and I as I should have anticipated, Chester's sense of timing was as astute as my own. No sooner had Bonicola reached the edge of the salad bowl than the door swung open and Chester bounded into the room. He surveyed the scene frantically. I was unable to act fast enough. Upon seeing Bonicola about to enjoy his first bit of nourishment in days, Chester leaped across the table, seemingly without touching floor, chairs, and or anything else between himself and our furry friend, and landed directly on top of the bunny. Oh no you don't, he shrieked. Bonicola, not sure what to do jumped high in the air and landed with a great scattering of greens, smack in the center of the salad bowl. Lettuce and the tomatoes and the carrots and the cucumbers of fly went flying all over the table and onto the floor. Chetter plattered his ear, wiggled his real end, and smiled in anticipation. To eat observers, to cat observers, this is known as the attack position. Run, Bonicula! I shouted. Bonicula turned in my direction, as if we, to ask where, anywhere I could, just to get out of his way, Chester sprang. Bonicula jumped, and in the flash of a second, they had changed the positions. Chester now found himself flat on his back, owing to the slipperiness of the salad dressing in the bowl, and Bonicula, too dazed to even think about the food now, hovered the quivering on the table. Chetter was having a great deal of difficulty getting back on his feet, but I knew it was only a matter of a second before he had attacked again, and I knew also that Nicola was too petrified to do anything to save himself, so I did the only thing I could. I barked, very loudly and very rapidly. The whole family rushed through the doors. Mr. Muller must have just come home because his coat was still on. Oh no, cried Mrs. Munro. That's it, Chester. This is Chester, the last stand. Chester rolled his eyes heavenward and didn't even try to move. Mom, said Toby, tugging at his mother's arm. Look at Bonicula. How did he get out of his cage? He looks scaled. Of course he is scaled, Mrs. Munro said. We probably forgot to latch his cage and he got out of And I think Chester has been chasing him. Toby put his face close to the rabbit. Mom, doesn't Bonicula look kinda sick? We'd better take them all to the vet to see if any damage was done, she answered. I started to whimper. No need for me to go to the vet. Mr. Munro patted my head. We may as well take a Harold along. He said he's probably due for his shot. Mrs. Munro carefully picked the chatter out of the salad bowl and carried him by the scruff of the neck to the kitchen. I'm going to give Chester a quick bath, she said to Mr. Munro. Why don't you put together a fresh salad? Toby, you and Peter put Bonicula back in his cage and then clean up the table. I didn't stick around for an assignment. This was not the time to be in the way. And besides, I now had a whole evening and night, ruined, worrying about the next morning's visit to the vet. This little effort of mine, I thought has been a disaster in more ways than one. Chapter 9 All the world does end well, almost. Looking back on that night, I remember, think, I remember thinking that this whole mess could never be resolved happily. What would have become of Bonicola, my new friend who was suffering from starvation? And what of Chester, my older friend, who seemed to have clipped his lead and, if you will pardon the expression, was in the doghouse with the Monroes. A far greater concern at that time, of course, was my own future, for on that night, all that consumed my thought was the fear of the next day's injections. It all seemed hopeless indeed. But looking back on the next day, I can tell you that happy... <coughs> Endings are possible, even in situations as fraught with complications as this one was. Only the next morning, we all piled into the car, some of us with greater reluctance than others, and trundled trundle off the vet. And by afternoon, we were on our way to solving our problems. The vet worked everything out very nicely. He discovered that Bonicula was suffering from Suffering from extreme hunger, I could have told him that, 
rather than jar his previous stomach with solid foods. The doctor decided he should be put on a liquid diet until he got better. So Bonicola was immediately given some carrot juice, which he drank eagerly. After he finished, he looked over at me with a great grin on his face and winked. Chetro was diagnosed as being emotionally overwrought. It was suggested that he start sessions with a cat psychiatrist to work out what the doctor called the case of a sibling library with a Bonicola. I asked the chatter later what a sibling was, but he wasn't speaking to me. So I looked it up. It's like a brother or sister, and the sibling library means you are competing with your brother or sister for attention. I wasn't sure this was Chetra's problem, but it sure explained a lot about Toby and Pete. As for me, as for me, when I came out the best, Dr. Wasserman was all set to give me my shot when the nurse came in with my card. Wait, doctor. This dog doesn't need his shot yet. He's too soon. So I got a pat on the head and a dog pop instead. These days, everything is back to normal. In the mono household, almost. But Nicola liked his liquid diet so much that the monos have kept him on it. And oddly enough, there had been no problems with the vegetables mysteriously turning white since. Chester, of course, insists that this proves his theory. Obviously, Harold, the liquidified vegetables take the place of the vegetable juices, so Bonicula has no need to go roaming anymore. Then he's not a vampire, I said. Nonsense, he's a vampire, all right, but he's a more than vampire. He gets his juices from a blender. Case closed, Sherlock, I queried. Case closed. Oh, Chester. Yes, Harold? What are those two funny marks on your neck? Chester jumped and I laughed. Very funny, he said as he began to bathe his tail. Very funny. The Monroes never knew anything of Chester's theory. They changed the market and to this day believe they were the victims of a curious bit of blight. But Nicola and I have become good friends. He still didn't say anything. But he snuggles up next to me by the fireplace and we take a long, cozy snoozes, snoozes together. One night I sang him a lullaby in the obscure dialect of his homeland, and he slept very peacefully. It was that night that cemented our friendship. Now, about Chester. I said that everything was back to normal. Almost. Naturally, Chester is the almost. He has been seeing his psychiatrist. Dr. Baruch Kajaket, twice a week for some time now. He takes his therapy very seriously. The other morning, I was trying to get a little sleep when Chester came over and nudged me in the ribs. Harold, do you realize we would never really communicate it? I mean, really communicate it. I opened one eye cautiously. And in order to communicate to Harold, you have to really be in touch with yourself. Are you in touch with yourself, Harold? Can you look yourself in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I am in touch with the meanest that is me, and I can reach out to you, meanest that is you. I closed my eye. I'm used to it by now. He talks like that all the time. He no longer reads Edgar Allan Poe at night. And once he concluded that he had been right about Bonicola, there had been no more talk about the vampires. The mark of the vampire sits, its usefulness obsolete, on its shelf. Right now, he's reading, finding yourself by screaming a lot. And the other night, when I heard the most awful noise coming from the basement, I didn't even bat on my eyelid. I knew it was just a chatter, finding himself, as he called it. He explains to me that he's getting in touch with his kidnood, and I've told him that's fine, just to let me know when he's going to do it so I can be elsewhere. I've had enough trouble from Chester's adventures. So, that's my story. And the story of a mysterious stranger, who no longer seems quite so mysterious, and who is definitely no longer a stranger. I've presented the fact as clearly as I could. And I leave it to you, dear listener, to draw your own conclusions. I must not bring this narrative to a close, since it is a Friday night. 
Toby is united to stay up late and read, and I can hear the crackling of a cellophane. I can only hope it covers two chocolate cupcakes with the cream filling. <웃음> 여러분 제 끝냈습니다.